Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Shannon Holmes. I'm a medical physicist with Standard Imaging and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Um, let me start, I guess, by saying that I sincerely hope that you and all of your families are staying safe and healthy. Uh, we're definitely living through some interesting times right now. Um, but we all know cancer doesn't wait on other diseases to finish their course, so um, we all continue to focus on giving our patients that high quality care that they need, especially in these really tough times. Um, so just a couple housekeeping things before I hand things over to our presenter today. We are recording the webinar, um, so if there's connectivity issues, I know some people's networks are pretty heavily loaded right now, um, or if you get called away in the middle, um, look for an email later today or tomorrow, you should be getting a link to the recording of the webinar. If you have questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to enter them at any time into the GoToMeeting dialog box, um, and we'll go through those at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, I guess I'm excited to introduce our presenter today. Jesse McKay is the Chief Physicist at Erlanger Health System in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and co-director of the Provision Erlanger Medical Physics Residency. Uh, with over 10 years of experience in a wide range of clinical environments, he has worked with an ever-increasing variety of technologies. His current interests include novel dosimeters for use with small fields and clinical process automation. So Jesse's presentation today is on the clinical utilization of the X-Raden W2 scintillator. Thanks, Shannon. Um, uh, and hello, everyone, and thanks for joining either from your your busy clinics or from the comfort of your home where you are no doubt maintaining the work of your busy clinics or uh, trying to figure out ways to do that. Um, and, and like Shannon, I, I do want to, I want to acknowledge these unprecedented times. Um, it doesn't seem like anyone has a playbook for exactly how to manage um, every individual situation that's presenting itself right now. Um, and, and while cancer care has its own set of challenges. I, I, I hope you're all able to manage the additional stress brought on by this pandemic. And, and I want to offer a word of encouragement. If you're feeling um, overwhelmed, um, just know that we're all in this together. And, and while I hope that my presentation is, is educational and interesting enough to follow up with uh, questions of its own, I'd, I'd be happy to take general questions offline. I'm, I'm open to any and, and all methods of support uh, for each other so we can continue to provide the quality care to our patients. Um, and I'll have my email posted at the end, so, so please feel free to reach out. So uh, I want to get started, of course, with, a, with an overview. Um, and uh, for those that haven't looked into PSDs or plastic scintillation detectors in depth, um, I'm going to cover a bit of history and explain some of the the relevant physics behind its function. Um, and, then, and then I'll share the projects that we've done here at Erlanger, both with the W1 and the, the W2. Uh, and, in, and in case you aren't aware of the differences, the, the W1 is a one by three millimeter PSD. It was launched in 2014 and uh, the W2 was released in 2018 and, and it has both uh, a one by one and a one by three uh, detector volume, as well as the ability to take scanning measurements. So uh, plastic scintillation detectors are um, relatively new as a commercial product, um, but uh, some really good research has been clipping along since the late 80s and, and early 90s and the the, the seminal work on clinically useful PSDs was published in 1992 by Sam Bedard and MD Anderson. Um, and since then, hundreds of research articles have been published and uh, up to one of the most recent works, which characterizes the new W2. Um, Bedard and a few others uh, from the University of Quebec, like uh, Louis Archambault and Luc Boyou, uh, have had a strong hand in the direction of the PSD research, and, and you'll see their names pop up fairly frequently if you do a literature search for the technology. If you read the title of Bedar's paper, it begins with a, a phrase that tends to get physicists fairly excited, which is water equivalency, and I'll expand on this and the other features in, in the next few slides. 
So I'm going to cover a little bit of theory here and um, uh, talk about the kind of the, the basic uh, construction of, of PSDs, which are, I mean, they really are simple devices. Um, the, the detection volume is usually a polymer matrix, a polystyrene or PMMA with an organic dopant. Um, it emits visible light when it's irradiated on a nanosecond time scale, and, and that visible light is proportional to dose. And um, there, there are really only a few cases where this proportionality is lost, and that includes uh, proton or, or ion beams and, as well as low KV beams. Um, there are three basic components of the system. Uh, there's a sensitive light volume, uh, the, the scintillator itself, uh, which is then attached to a light guide. Um, and then uh, at the end of which is, is a photo detector. And, and the, the size of the scintillator can be very small. Um, the, the only limitation really is the size of the signal strength. Um, so the more sensitive the, the photo detector, uh, the smaller the scintillator can be. Um, and, that, and that was one of the barriers in reducing the size of the, the W1, the first iteration uh, down to the W2. Um, and that was solved by uh, developing a specialized electrometer dedicated to measuring the signal from the W2. Um, and this, the signal is on the order of picoamps. So let's look at what makes PSDs so great, so appropriate for use in a clinical QA setting. This is really the meat and potatoes of, of why uh, these detectors uh, serve a, a large uh, range of functionality. Um, and, and as I mentioned, so at first they're water equivalent. They have nearly the same density, electron density, mass energy coefficient, and electron stopping power is water. Um, they are dose rate independent, uh, which for flatting filter free beams is especially relevant. Uh, the response to dose is linear, and um, they are minimally in energy independent. Uh, with caveat being for, for again, for protons and, and low KV photons. Uh, for protons, this nonlinearity can be mitigated through a, a quenching correction that's been um, reported in the literature for high LET measurements. Um, PSDs give real-time measurements, so there isn't any processing time, like with OSLDs or TLDs or other uh, devices used for in-field measurements. Um, and there there's almost no temperature or pressure correction. And, and really for clinical use, that there's a half a degree per degree, uh, sorry, a half a percent per degree Celsius. And that can be ignored um, unless uh, measuring in vivo, which has been done and reported on. Um, since they're so small, there's a high spatial resolution, which is obviously great for measuring small fields. And they're unaffected by magnetic fields, so they can be used in MR Linux. So, um, with, with all these positives, um, you might wonder what the compromise is, right? Like, why hasn't there been a wider adoption of PSDs um, in clinical QA use? Well, uh, since the signal of the PSD is light-based, um, we have to keep the optical fiber perfectly shielded from the outside light contamination. And that's fairly simple with the protective coating. Um, but shrink off radiation is generated within the light pipe itself when it's irradiated. Um, you, might, you might remember from your physics of relativity class, and, and I didn't, I had to look it up, that when a charged particle travels faster in a medium than the speed of light in that medium, uh, much like a fighter jet crossing the sound bar barrier, uh, and it, it emits visible light in, in, the, in the blue range, so this uh, same light that we see in nuclear reactors. Um, the threshold for the shrink off generation is 150 keV, so above which it is generated, which obviously falls within the useful spectrum of therapeutic radiation. So we do need a way to deal with this extraneous signal, uh, and we do that through a, um, a calibration procedure. Um, so let me take a look at uh, first what we're trying to filter out um, through this calibration procedure. and. Um, I'm going to uh, use some slides from uh, Louis Archambault, who gave a fantastic talk on uh, PSDs at a recent AAPM uh, spring clinical meeting. So here you, you see the raw signal uh, that reaches the photo detector is, is actually from, from two sources, the, the scintillation itself um, from, from the scintillator, 
and then the Shrinkoff emission. And, and you can see the Shrinkoff radiation is, is um, uh, uh, essentially is, is a stem effect uh, where like the more optical fiber that's in the field, the more the signal is contaminated by Shrinkoff light. Um, and that can account for as much as 20% uh, of, the, of the raw signal. Um, so in order to measure a dose D, which you know, of course is the end goal, we need to find a way to take the signal that we get, um, the total signal, and then filter out just the shrink off light to measure what we want, which is just the scintillation of the, um, of the detector. Um, so you can see that on the second graph, there's, there's nowhere along the light spectrum that the signal of the shrink off light doesn't exist. Um, but there is a way to filter out that signal. And again, this has to be done as part of the, the calibration process of, of, any, um, of any PSD. So this process involves measuring two parts of the light spectrum. Uh, and, you, and we measure it uh, separately. Uh, the blue and the green wave bands are measured for each dose signal and then compared for two separate irradiation setups. And the difference in the two radiation setups is, is the amount of stem in the radiation field. Again, this is a stem effect, so we're just varying the amount of stem in the, in the field or the light pipe that's in the field. And when you take two different measurements with different optical fiber amounts in the field, the only thing that changes is the shrink-off light, um, considering the, the scintillator is kept at the same place in the field and, and is irradiated the same amount. Um, so here's a look at the, the formalism, and, and you can see that if you take the, the two green and blue readings and subtract them, then you're left with just the, the Shrinkoff uh, component. And then, then if you take the ratio of the two Shrinkoff signals, you get what's called the Shrinkoff light ratio, uh, the CLR, which remains constant for all measurements. So once the CLR is known, uh, dose then can be calculated with the formula at the bottom there, where, where A can be found by uh, irradiating a reference field of known dose, so your you know, you're 10 by 10. The, the two blue and green measurements can either be taken on, on separate electrometers, um, and there's a way to set that up, uh, or, or an electrometer with two signals, and I highly recommend you trying to find an electrometer with two signals, and we happen to have the standard imaging supermax, and it makes the process uh, extremely easy with, uh, with the dual channel setup. Um, so now that I've talked about a little bit of theory, um, I want to cover um, how we make use of, of the X-ray and PSDs at Erlanger. And, um, we were fortunate enough to have purchased both the W1 and the and the W2, <clears throat> excuse me, very soon after they became available. So um, we, we've done our best to put them uh, to good use over the last six years. Um, and I'll be mentioning the W1 and the W2 um, both to some degree, and um, just depending on when the project was performed in our clinic. And but but as far as our projects go, anywhere they're they're kind of interchangeable. Um, again, with the difference being the size of the, de of the detector and the uh, um, specialized use of the W2 for scanning measurements. <clears throat> um, so let me walk through the, the calibration process first. And these are these are images from our, our center. And so this is the way that we performed the calibration. And um, the, the manual obviously walks you through this. But um, I just wanted to outline um, the uh, the logistics of the calibration. So the, the CLR, it can be generated in, in one of two ways. So uh, for measurements with the standard LINAC, uh, the calibration plates on the left are used to hold the, <clears throat> the fiber optic cable in a minimum and a maximum fiber position while, while it keeps the scintillating volume in the same location. And um, so a 40 by 40 field is used to gener generate the CLR while a 10 by 10 field can be used to create the absolute dose calibration factor. And you can see that 10 by 10 outlined on the, on the plates. And also you can see where the fiber would go in into a minimum and a maximum position while the maximum position is kind of a loop, uh, putting more of the stem in the field. Um, if the W1 or the W2 um, is being used on a machine with non-standard reference fields, uh, like, a, like a CyberKnife, and we have um, a CyberKnife VSI at our center, 
um, <clears throat> a special jig positions the fiber in a minimum and maximum position. It just has a tighter loop than, than what's in the plates. Um, it's the same concept as the plates, but just reworked for smaller fields. And you can see how the projected beam would irradiate a bit of extra stem as it loops right above the detection volume. Um, Uh, it's, it's recommended that the CLR be generated with uh, an appropriate field size. So I would follow this recommendation. And if you're um, using small fields, I would create your CLR with the setup on the right. If you're using the detector in a large field um, environment, then I would set up your CLR and irradiate it with the plates on the left. Um, so these are a few images from our first project that we designed um, with the W1 uh, back in 2014. <clears throat> it, was, uh, it was a validation project to, um, and we took a look at the Monte Carlo algorithm and, and the multi-plan treatment planning system for our CyberKnife. And if you're not familiar with CyberKnife, um, <clears throat> there are two algorithms available. Uh, Ray trace, which is a simple effective depth-based algorithm and Monte Carlo, and that's it. There's no nothing in between. And uh, so in a homogeneous medium, there isn't really much difference between the two, but um, you can you can see in the picture on the left that um, in a heterogeneous environment, there, there can be major differences. And those differences can be on the order of 50%, as has been shown in the literature. Um, so in, in the same image, you can see how ray trace doesn't really model any of the lack of the lateral scatter or rebuild up that would be present with an isolated lung lesion. Um, we fitted the SDVP phantom from standard imaging with, um, with lung slabs and calculated an AP beam with each of the 12 cone sizes. Um, in the graph, you can see we overlaid measurements with the A16 uh, micro ion chamber, those are the, the green triangles, uh, which had been uh, observed to break down actually with Monte Carlo agreement um, in cone sizes smaller than 20 millimeters. Um, but the W1 agreed within 3% on all 12 cones. And, and this was relevant for us uh, as we treat a good number of SBRT lung cases in our, uh, with our CyberKnife. Um, and, and we would love to look at a, a follow-up test, which could be um, uh, more intricate beam arrangement in the form of an end-to-end -end test or even a, a patient QA um, on the same setup. Um, our Monte Carlo verification project, it, it led to kind of a side extension project because we'd noticed um, an increase in uncertainty in the Monte Carlo uh, point dose to the <clears throat> small target we had contoured in the multi-plan system. Uh, the contour was, it was designed to reflect the actual size of the one by three W1. Um, so you can kind of see how the image blows up and then the red voxels in that uh, most blown up image don't perfectly form a cylinder. And um, that, again, that's a reflection of trying to um, model the exact size of the W1 or volume of the W1. And what we saw is that the, uh, as the cone size increased, as we went from five to seven, all the way up to 60 millimeter cones, uh, the uncertainty value of the point dose to the scintillator increased linearly, as you can see in the graph. <clears throat> so follow-up discussions with the vendor uh, revealed that we, um, that in the multi-plan system, the Monte Carlo algorithm uh, limits the number of photon traces to save computing time. And so the number of photon traces used per calculation volume uh, can thus be larger, uh, less rather, for larger cone sizes than for smaller ones. And, and that results in a greater statistical uncertainty. And this uncertainty becomes more pronounced uh, uh, when the target size gets significantly small as we were trying to do with the W1. So our results uh, suggested a practical solution <clears throat> in multi-plan and whenever you've been, whenever you're contouring a very small volume uh, you should introduce a separate structure with a substantially larger volume around it. So like a one centimeter sphere, for instance, and use that as a target <clears throat> as in addition to the small target uh, to reduce that uncertainty. Um, and this gave us better agreement with our measurements when we were taking um, uh, 
measurements with the uh, with the W1. So our following project was in a similar vein. Um, a recent study uh, inspired us to validate our CyberKnife output factors, um, especially for cones less than 10 millimeters. And I know that there's a varying degree of rather wide range of output factors that have been reported for, especially the small cones on the CyberKnife. Um, the data here shows the diode over-responded compared to the PSDs and the, the differences in those readings increased as the field size decreased up to 70% on the five millimeter cone. So uh, we included both uh, commissioning diode readings as well as um, some diode readings that we, we repeated at the time of the study. <clears throat> and then on top of the, the PSD readings and you can see the increase in differences start at the 20 millimeter cone and, and continue down to the five millimeter cone, which uh, between those two sizes, it represents about half of the available cone sizes. So um, we were, uh, we felt um, validated in our, in our measurements using the, the PSD as, a, as an alternate measurement tool. Our current project um, that we're still accumulating data on um, was designed about a year ago to answer the question of how small of a target we could treat with our, our new true beam. Okay, so there's a little bit of backstory here, and that is uh, that through a change in strategy between developing the um, deliverables of the true beam to actually implementing it, uh, uh, we were wanting to treat uh, SRS on a machine that was essentially ordered with only SBRT in mind, and therefore didn't come with any micro MLCs or, or cones. Um, and I, I get the sense that this is um, a situation that some clinics find themselves in where they um, didn't purchase equipment uh, for specialized treatment, but you know, at the time of delivery, want to implement these specialized treatments. So <clears throat> we wanted to um, investigate this in house. And our instinct was to cut off anything below two centimeters, uh, any lesions below two centimeters with the Millennium 120, the, the standard MLC package for the true beam. Um, and this was due to our lack of confidence in the dosimetry and beam modeling, but um, we did want to determine this, this limit empirically. So <clears throat> we set up a system that allowed us to compare ion chambers with the PSDs to, uh, to measure point doses of each SRS and SBRT plan uh, knowing that at some point the volume detectors would under-respond due to volume averaging um, as the targets got smaller and smaller. And so we've measured uh, over 40 patients in this past year. And so far we've seen that there, is, there certainly is a point where the volume averaging effect <clears throat> of the uh, gas-filled ion chambers um, uh, becomes an issue. And even our micro ion chamber uh, the A16 that we use is, is not, uh, has not given us uh, consistent results on these uh, smaller fields that um, sometimes um, one of uh, the physicians want to treat in our clinic. Uh, and so the PSD has given us uh, far more consistent readings with these measurements. So um, our physics resident may actually take up this, this next project, which is um, kind of in the works of development. <clears throat> we did, we've done some measurements with it, um, but uh, we haven't yet done any, any rings with the PSD. The background on this is that we recently had a run of uh, clinical uh, facial uh, electron plans <clears throat> that were complicated and required uh, tight skin collimation with custom lead sheet cutouts. Um, the, the dose perturbation by high densities in the field is, is basically a standard textbook figure that everyone should be familiar with, um, but we, uh, we wanted to measure uh, these effects on site. And so um, we're working out a setup that might look like uh, a lead strip suspended on the surface of the water in a scanning tank. And then we would use the, the scanning feature of the W2 system uh, to generate a 3D map of, of the dose so that we can uh, validate what our TPS is not able to report. <clears throat> um, there have been other validations of this phenomenon through other measurement techniques, so it's it's mostly a, an enrichment project uh, for our resident, but it, it'll also give us uh, a good clinical reminder that, you know, while our, our TPS doesn't model skin collimation, 
um, the hotspot that's generated by uh, high dense materials on the field um, should be a consideration, um, especially when planning for irregular surfaces um, with by OARs like uh, in the face. Um, I, I certainly don't want to imply that we have all the possibilities uh, for clinical utilization of PSDs in our, cl in our clinic. <clears throat> um, so I, I wanted to end with a few examples from the literature. Uh, there, are, there are some interesting applications for in vivo dosimetry, uh, one where PSDs were attached to the surface of rectal balloons to measure anterior rectal wall dose during prostate IMRT treatments. Um, they recommended expanding the work to SBRT treatments where obviously the unexpected increases in fractional dose may become more of an urgent concern. Um, brachytherapy has also seen some attention in the literature uh, where uh, steep gradients in dose are ideal for, for pinpoint detectors. Um, uh, of note, again, there's this nonlinearity uh, with um, an energy dependence with uh, uh, below 100 keV, so absolute dose readings would be uh, complicated by this uh, characteristic. Um, and then, of course, there's a wide application for use in, in small field measurements. Um, where the most notable recent publication is the TRS-483, uh, uh, where they list the W1 as having uh, no beam quality correction factor for any field size, and therefore a KQ value of one across the board, um, which interestingly was not the, the case for um, any other detector. Um, and lastly, I, I haven't found it yet, but I hope someone would design an application that uses uh, PSDs with um, another one of my favorite topics, uh, 3D printing. Um, if, you have, if you have thoughts on this um, or, or anything else I'd talk about, I'd, I'd I'd be happy to take questions on that again, either now or, or through through email um, as a follow up. So um, thanks again for, for listening and I'll, I'll turn it back over to, to Shannon. Thank you, Jess, that was wonderful. Um, there's one question entered so far, so I'd like to encourage anybody else who wants to enter questions, uh, please go ahead and do so. Um, this one says they missed the first few minutes. Did you talk about using the, the W2 for scanning commissioning beam data? So I know you didn't talk about that much, but do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I, um, th this kind of pairs with our uh, electron um, project where we're you know trying to figure out the <clears throat> uh, if we can replicate that well-known high dose area underneath the high density. Um, I think that our um, our the scanning on our um, cyberknife system um, would would benefit from the the W2 measurements and um, I, I certainly should have mentioned this because it's definitely been a discussion point in our our clinic that we could use the W2 to scan our um, small fields especially um, under 20 millimeters on our cyberknife to you know obviously we've validated our output factors but also to uh, validate our um, our profiles, our off uh, off axis ratios that uh, we had, had you know originally measured with with diodes. So I'd, um, I I haven't used the the scanning feature of the W2 um, as much as I would have liked at this point. Um, that's not because we um, uh, don't have any intention to. We just haven't gotten uh, gotten to that part yet. But I'm excited to, to take a look at that feature. Um, the next question was, have you seen any dose rate dependency? Um, not with our beams. Um, we, we've got a uh, flattening filter free beam on our uh, true beam that is a, a 2400 MU per minute. Um, and, and we have not seen any dose rate dependency. And, and I'll, you know, I'll emphasize that we haven't looked at that explicitly, but um, I know that there have been reports in the literature on dose rate independence. Um, yeah, obviously, Sam Badar mentions it in his research, but there have you know, been follow-ups. Um, so I, uh, I, I, would, I would love to know the upper end of that. Um, you know, where does that uh, independence break down? I imagine that there is a point where it breaks down, but um, we, haven't, we haven't seen that here. 
The next one, I think I might be able to answer a little better. The, the question is, does the STEM effect influence the point of measurement uncertainty? Um, we have seen sometimes um, if people are applying a CLR factor that is slightly incorrect, um, and then they search for the, the maximum point of measurement, especially if they're scanning, because it, it's not properly removing the STEM effect, then it can look like your effective point of measurement is offset from the physical effective point of measurement. So if you're seeing that offset, um, it's probably worth double checking your CLR values. Um, so then the next one, uh, someone wants to know how long you've been using the W2 in your clinic, Jess. Sure. Um, we we were fortunate to get one early on um, in 2018, I believe, um, and uh, we we kind of set it in motion or set it in use uh, right away using, <clears throat> or sorry, within the um, uh, patient QA point dose measurement um, project. Um, we we've again we're hoping to use the scanning feature um, at some point soon. Um, and then we've also had experience with the W1, um, again, fairly early on, starting in 2014. Um, so uh, it's not uh, a detector that um, we have uh, used on a routine basis for all of our measurements, um, but for the measurements where it makes sense to use a, a detector that has water equivalents or um, like we were talking about dose rate independence, of course, any of the small field measurements we do, we definitely reach for um, the W, now the W2, it used to be the W1 that we would pull out, but um, we, we try to stick with the, the one by one measurement. Um, I will say this, we, we have found use for both uh, the one by one and the one by three fibers that, that come with the W2 system. Um, so uh, the, the signal strength is different. Obviously, you've got a smaller signal strength for the W2s uh, one by one, um, and we we found that um, that we needed to, I guess, verify uh, the W1s small uh, reading with the W, um, or sorry, the W2s one by one small reading with the W2s one by three. And that's only happened on a handful of occasions, but as a as an end user, I, I do want to say that the, having the two fiber options is, is helpful. That's good to know. Um, can you explain, let's say, on one of your plots of output factors, you showed the W2 measured a higher output factor than the W1 for the five millimeter cone. Do you have any guess on the explanation of that? Mm, I don't. Um, you know, it. it a lot of our um, measurements that you know we were finding you know need for an explanation, um, especially with these small fields. I think our go-to explanation is that with the flattening filter-free beam, it's it's actually very difficult to align uh, the the you know the perfect center of the beam um, with a very small uh, detector. You know they're the system comes with dummy sources that you know you can uh, try to align with using imaging, um, but they're so small, uh, both on the field size and the the detector size that um, I know in our output factor measurements we we had to do um, kind of a validation of the of the center of the beam, which did not align, for instance, with our laser as perfectly as the detector was 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 showing. You know we obviously do a laser alignment. Um, verification test uh, for a system that falls within range, but um, the detector is so small that it's actually very easy to kind of miss that, um, you know, perfect center of the field. Um, so that, that would be my first um, inclination if I saw a reading that didn't, um, uh, well, that wasn't expected is to, um, uh, is to verify that the center of the field was being irradiated and measured. When you made those output factor measurements, um, you were comparing with a diode measurement. Did you apply the TRS-43 corrections to those diode measurements? Yeah, we had uh, we had a, an uncorrected set of data and a corrected set of data. Obviously, the corrected set of data was, was closer. Um, and that was interesting, and that's a nice um, reminder that um, the, the corrections are important to make. Um, so, uh, but they, the, the differences in the um, the PSD measurements and the diodes, even corrected diodes, um, 
were still noticeable, uh, especially you know down to the smaller field sizes. They, there, there really wasn't any appreciable difference in the larger field sizes, but down to the smaller field sizes, we're seeing again some discrepancy between detectors. You know, just kind of pointing again to this need to find um, uh, a detector that has you know the least variability uh, possible, and it, it, it seems that. Um, you know, the, for us anyway, we, we rely on the measurements of the, of the PSDs to, to validate, um, you know, what we're finding with the standard diodes. Have you seen any angular dependence with the scintillators? The question is specifically, uh, would you recommend it for use for something like CyberKnife patient QA? No, uh, well, I, I should say no, we haven't. Um, uh, tried to find any angular dependence in our clinic. I know that it's been reported on, um, but uh, a patient QA measurement uh, is something that we would love to follow up on. I, I think I mentioned that in one of the slides that <clears throat> you know, our, our validation measurements with for Monte Carlo uh, were taken with a single field. Um, that really was, um, you know, a time issue just trying to get as many measurements in as, as we could um, in, in a shorter amount of time. Um, you know, with the CyberKnife, obviously, patient full patient deliveries take you know on the order of 30 minutes sometimes. Um, so, uh, but we would love to expand um, our our validation of our Monte, Car Monte Carlo algorithm to a patient QA scenario um, where you could you know see some of that angular dependence maybe showing up, um, and uh, you know we would hopefully be able to isolate that. Um, we can direct the CyberKnife obviously to deliver from multiple directions, and so we could um, we could easily prove that to ourselves um, in house that you know there's there's no uh, what well, we hope to be no uh, angular dependence on the uh, on the measurements with the with the scintillator. Yeah, I know um, Richard Popple at the University of Alabama at Birmingham has done patient specific measurements with his. Um, Oh, now I'm going to blank on the name of it. The, the Truveen system where the, um, the couch. Oh, the no, um, oh. uh, I'll think of it later, but he has, he has done some very small field. Um, there's actually got a publication on it, small field verifications, um, for patient specific QA. Um, but he said the only angular dependence he saw with it was when they had vertex fields. Um, they were seeing some odd behavior and then realized that it, um, it was most likely because they were actually irradiating the, um, the max SD, the electrometer that goes with the W2. Um, and so okay. since they've moved that off the end of the couch so that it doesn't get irradiated for those vertex fields, uh, they haven't seen issues with angular dependence. Oh, that is interesting. Yeah, we we do the um, the same kind of move with our our max SD. Um, if there's not going to be any chance of irradiating it, we just leave it on the end of the table. But if there is, um, then we we kind of we kick it off the end and kind of put it on a chair, actually below the, the table. Sure. Um, you kind of separate it a little bit more um, from from being irradiated. So that's a that's a good tip. That's a good idea. Um, there's a question: Is the photo detector a point of failure or risk? Um, I guess I would say yes. There's there's always a chance. I mean, their optics are are tricky things, um, but it should be relatively robust here. Have you seen any issues with yours? Or no do you have concerns. I, I my um, I guess our observations are that um, yeah, like you're saying that um, uh, there there's a you, you've got this compounding effect, right? Of of like a small uh, reading a small signal uh, and that signal also being a light signal. Um, <clears throat> so we do see some uh, uh, what, what appears to us to be kind of like this delay of a reading where you've got the radiation that cuts off and then this kind of like um, uh, continued uh, accumulation of, of charge in the electrometer. Um, but uh, it's, it's been something that we've measured uh, repeatedly for uh, the same uh, the same irradiation setup, and found it to be very consistent. So uh, we've kind of proven to ourselves that, you know, even though it does seem to be uh, anyway, it, it seems to act differently than what we'd see in an ion chamber. We've kind of proven to ourselves that uh, that it's that it is consistent. And uh, you know, I should have given this disclaimer long ago. You know, Shannon is obviously the, the more 
uh, the, the higher technical expertise on this. I'm just reporting <laughs> on on what we're what we're seeing in the in the clinic. And um, yeah, what I mean, what are your thoughts on that, Shannon? Um, I guess I don't have much to add to what you said there. That was the I guess the one thing that that does come to mind is the um, radiation damage to the fiber is something also that that can come into play. Um, how frequently have you felt like you needed to recalibrate or um, reassess the the chair and cough correction? Yeah, that um, that's a good question. Uh, we have recalibrated. Um, we recalibrate the absolute dose correction more often than we uh, recalibrate the CLR. Um, the sure. W2 has the the CLR library and the absolute dose library. Um, and for, uh, we, we found that we've needed to do a, um, a different absolute dose calibration for, um, different energies, um, and don't know quite why that has been, um, helpful. Um, and especially when we're talking about a difference between a, a flattening filter free beam and, um, a flattened beam. Um, so we do in our library, we have different, um, calibration factors for the different energies um, that we shoot. So we've got one for our cyber knife, which is you know, only 6X flattening filter free. Then we've got one for our 10X flattening filter free. Uh, we've got one for our 6X regular flattened beam. Um, and so I, I would say that um, that is that is something that we've seen uh, that we weren't expecting uh, out of the gate is to need those separate calibration factors. Um, and I don't know if you've uh, have comments on whether or not you, you've heard of any other clinics doing that or not? Um, there is there is a little bit better uncertainty um, when you do it that way. Um, in general, they're energy independent, but you do uh, kind of like with the CLR, it, you could use a larger field size, but the closer you are to the clinical setup that you're going to be measuring, the more accurate your results are going to be. Mm -hmm. um, just because of the, yeah. the different scatter conditions at the um, the Max SD or the photodiode box for the W1, that seems to be where any um, variations tend to stem from is the, the radiation scatter to those photodiodes can cause some additional signal, signal or additional noise. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll um, validate that point. Um, we, we kind of found that out the hard way that you want to use a CLR that was generated with your Kind of an appropriate field size right like you want to use the small setup if you're going to be irradiating small fields you want to use the large setup if you're going to be irradiating large fields and we tried to use the clr correction from a large field when we were measuring our cyber knife fields when we were doing our output validation and found that there there was a a, a discrepancy we didn't know why until we you know redid the clr measurement with small fields and it uh, corrected it itself so um, i can definitely confirm that Okay. Um, if you've done scanning, have you used a reference signal with the W2 or did you just scan and make the measurements directly without a reference detector? Um, we've only tested the scanning feature and we haven't used it for okay. any, you know, measurements we've um, okay. actually... I I, I guess I can answer the question then that that I have I have done it both ways um, and have gotten good, good results both with and without a reference detector. Um, you do have to, well, as you know, Jess, you have to scan kind of slowly um, in order to get a reasonable signal just because the simulator creates such a small signal. Um, mm -hmm. So it, we recommend at least a one second dwell at each measurement point. Um, and if, you, if you're dwelling that long, um, a pulse drop or an extra pulse isn't so critical um, as it is when you're measuring um, very short times. Um, and so the reference detector doesn't play quite as critical a role in that sort of slower scanning as it does in the, a faster scan. Um, so can I, can I follow up with a question yeah. of my own? I uh -huh. want to know if there, there have been any any successful continuous scanning done. I mean, we when we tested it, we did the, like you said, the point dose measurement, one mm -hmm. second dwell time. Um, and th those were successful. Um, but has anyone done any continuous scanning like you're talking about? 
Um, Louis Archambault did when we were first testing the system. Um, I don't know of any um, users since then who have, but that was that was his method, and they saw pretty noisy scans, so they ended up doing something like three or four scans and then averaging them in order to try and get rid of some of the noise. Hmm. So we do still recommend a step-by-step, -step, um, if possible. Someone asked the question if a special electrometer is needed. Um, may it be used with the MAX 4000 um, or an IBA scanning electrometer um, with the, or for the W2 specifically? Um, and the answer to that is that it has a dedicated optics and electronics unit that's called the MAX SD. Um, you can do your CLR measurements with that. You can do your point dose measurements with that. Um, if you're scanning with your water tank, then it will create um, convert the corrected signal into an analog output and you connect a triax from the output of that max SD into your scanning electrometer and then you can record the data with your scanning electrometer. Um, but I'm assuming when you've used your W2 for point measurements, Jess, you've just used the max SD. Yeah, we uh, we did try to uh, integrate it to our Blue Phantom and um, found that there was something on the Blue Phantom side. Actually, this is an IBA product for uh, for um, you know annual scanning tank uh, that didn't allow the the W2 to um, feed its signal into the software. Um, so we'd love to see that integrated um, from from the IBA side on our end anyway. Did you have it set up um, with a diode reference, or were you trying to use an ion chamber reference? Oh, I'm trying to remember. Because I know um, some, God. especially older systems, sometimes it, it has an issue with um, a diode on one channel and an ion chamber on the other because the biases are tied together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I believe it was, it was um, I think we we're doing it on our cyber knife, so we would have used a diode reference chamber Okay. Um, and you know, obviously, with um, no voltage applied, um, you know, it should it should be able to accept both of those signals. I think that's what that was our confusion is you know we, we should have seen a uh, a successful reading, but um, couldn't quite get there with the with a diode reference chamber. So yeah, all that to say, we have we've not been able to use a reference chamber with with our measurements. Okay, I know people have used it with the Blue Phantom, so maybe I'll have to dig through the archives and see if I can connect you with somebody who did. Sure. Ours um, ours is a converted blue, um, so it's it's a much older tank. Okay. Um, and it's, Gone through many iterations of upgrades. Okay, maybe I need to talk to you about how to increase the. Uh, there's a gain that's applied to the output, right? And by default, it's a 25 times gain, but maybe we can up that for you to get a higher signal, and maybe that'll help. But oh, yeah. we can we can talk about that later. Sure. Um, let's see. I think there were maybe one or two more questions. Let me see. If I get down here. Was there any need to use um, shielding? of the max SD if it's left in the bunker during measurements? Well, it has to be in the bunker just because the fiber is short, but did you find that you needed to shield it at all? Um, yeah, like I mentioned, we we have stuck it off the end of the couch onto a chair, kind of lowered it off of the table. Um, I don't think that that was because we noticed anything um, being uh, unexplained with the measurements while the max SD was on the table. Um, you know, we kind of follow the recommendations to kind of elongate the, what is it, the three millimeter or three meter cable, uh, kind of stretch it out as long as we can and get the max SD as far away from the beam as we can. Um, there's just enough length to get it off the end of the table. So we have done that on, on occasion um, when we felt like it could be an issue, but we haven't directly seen that be a problem. Yeah. Um, next question was whether that blue CyberKnife CLR jig was built by you or if it's commercially available. And that one comes with the W2. So that's that's from Standard Imaging. That's commercially available. And somebody reminded me that what uh, Richard Popple was measuring was Varian's HyperArc system. There um, it is. So I think that's the last of the questions. Um, I think uh, judging by the number of questions we've gotten, we had to... Uh, a lot of people very interested in what you were what you were presenting, um, but Good. thank you very much for your time. Um, we really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you all for being here. And um, again, I hope that everyone uh, is doing the best they can. And uh, good luck to everyone in their keeping the quality of care high in their in their clinics in this time. Yes, indeed. Thank you.